every year in the spring, the fifth graders of Beecher Prep go away for three days and two nights to a place called the Broarwood Nature Reserve in Pennsylvania. It's a four-hour bus drive away. The kids sleep in cabins with bunk beds. There are campfires and s'mores and long walks through the woods. The teachers have been prepping us about this all year long, so all the kids in the grade are excited about it. Except for me. And it's not even that I'm not excited, because I kind of am. It's just I've never slept away from home before, and I'm kind of nervous. Most kids have had sleepovers by the time they're my age. A lot of kids have gone to sleepaway camps, or stayed with their grandparents, or whatever. Not me. Not unless you include hospital stays. But even then, Mom or Dad always stayed with me overnight. But I never slept over Tata and Papa's house, or Aunt Kate and Uncle Poe's house. When I was really little, that was mainly because there were too many medical issues. Like my trach tube needing to be cleared every hour. Or reinserting my feeding tube if it got detached. But when I got bigger, I just never felt like sleeping anywhere else. There was one time when I half slept over Christopher's house. We were about eight, and we were still best friends. Our family had gone for a visit to his house, and me and Christopher were having such a great time playing Lego Star Wars that I didn't want to leave when it was time to go. We were like, please, 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 can we have a sleepover? So our parents said yes, and Mom and Dad and Via drove home. And me and Christopher stayed up till midnight playing, until Lisa, his mom, said, Okay, guys, time to go to bed. Well, that's when I kind of panicked a bit. Lisa tried to help me go to sleep, but I just started crying that I wanted to go home. So at 1 a.m., Lisa called Mom and Dad. And Dad drove all the way back out to Bridgeport to pick me up. We didn't get home until 3 a.m. So my one and only sleepover, up until now, was pretty much of a disaster. Which is why I'm a little nervous about the nature retreat. On the other hand, I'm really excited. Known for... I asked Mom to buy me a new rolling duffel bag because my old one had Star Wars stuff on it and there was no way I was going to take that to the fifth grade nature retreat. As much as I love Star Wars, I don't want that to be what I'm known for. Everyone's known for something in middle school. Like Reed is known for really being into marine life and the oceans and things like that. And Amos is known for being a really good baseball player. And Charlotte is known for having been in a TV commercial when she was six. And Jimena's known for being really smart. My point is that in middle school, you kind of get known for what you're into. And you have to be careful about stuff like that. Like Max G and Max W will never live down their Dungeons and Dragons obsession. So I was actually trying to ease out of the whole Star Wars thing a bit. I mean... It'll always be special to me, like it is with the doctor who put in my hearing aids. It's just not the thing I wanted to be known for in middle school. I'm not sure what I want to be known for, but it's not that. That's not exactly true. I do know what I'm really known for. But there's nothing I can do about that. A Star Wars duffel bag I could do something about. Packing. Mom helped me pack the night before the big trip. We put all the clothes I was taking on my bed, and she folded everything neatly and put it inside the bag while I watched. It was a plain blue rolling duffel, by the way. No logos or artwork. What if I can't sleep at night, I asked. Take a book with you. Then if you can't sleep, you can pull out your flashlight and read for a bit until you get sleepy, she answered. I nodded. What if I have a nightmare? Your teachers will be there, sweetie, she said. And Jack and your friends. I can bring
bring Babu, I said. That was my favorite stuffed animal when I was little. A small black bear with a soft black nose. You don't really sleep with him anymore, do you, said Mom? No, but I keep him in my closet in case I wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep, I said. I could hide him in my bag. No one would know. Then let's do that, Mom nodded, getting Babu from inside my closet. I wish they allowed cell phones, I said. I know, me too, she said. Though I know you're going to have a great time, Augie. You sure you want me to pack, Babu? Yeah, but way down where no one can see him, I said. She stuck Babu deep inside the bag and then stuffed the last of my t-shirts on top of him. So many clothes for just two days. Three days and two nights, I corrected her. Yep, she nodded, smiling. Three days and two nights. She zipped up the duffel bag and picked it up. Not too heavy. Try it. I picked up the bag. Fine, I shrugged. She sat on the bed. Hey, what happened to your Empire Strikes Back poster? Oh, I took that down ages ago, I answered. She shook her head. Huh, I didn't notice that before. I'm trying to, you know, change my image a bit, I explained. Okay, she smiled, nodding like she understood. Anyway, honey, you have to promise me you won't forget to put on the bug spray, okay? On the legs, especially when you're hiking through the woods. It's right here in the front compartment. Uh-huh. And put on your sunscreen, she said. You do not want to get a sunburn. And don't, I repeat, do not forget to take your hearing aids off if you go swimming. Would I get electrocuted? No, but you'd be in real hot water with Daddy, because those things cost a fortune, she laughed. I put the rain poncho in the front compartment, too. Same thing goes if it rains, Augie, okay? Make sure you cover the hearing aids with the hood. Aye, aye, sir, I said, saluting. She smiled and pulled me over. I can't believe how much you've grown up this year, Augie, she said softly, putting her hands on the sides of my face. Do I look taller? Definitely, she nodded. I'm still the shortest one in my grade. I'm not really even talking about your height, she said. Suppose I hate it there. You're going to have a great time, Augie. I nodded. She got up and gave me a quick kiss on the forehead. Okay, so I say we get to bed now. It's only 9 o'clock, Mom. Your bus leaves at 6 a.m. tomorrow. You don't want to be late. Come on, chop, chop. Your teeth are brushed? I nodded and climbed into bed. She started to lie down next to me. You don't need to put me to bed tonight, Mom, I said. I'll read on my own till I get sleepy. Really? She nodded, impressed. She squeezed my hand and gave it a kiss. Okay, then. Good night, love. Have sweet dreams. You too. She turned on the little reading light beside the bed. I'll write you letters, I said as she was leaving, even though I'll probably be home before you guys even get them. Then we can read them together, she said, and threw me a kiss. When she left my room, I took my copy of The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe off the night table and started reading until I fell asleep. Though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little further back, into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. Daybreak. The next day I woke up really early. It was still dark inside my room, and even darker outside. Though I knew it would be morning soon. I turned over on my side, but didn't feel at all sleepy. That's when I saw Daisy sitting near my bed. I mean, I knew it wasn't Daisy, 
But for a second, I saw a shadow that looked just like her. I didn't think it was a dream then, but now, looking back, I know it must have been. It didn't make me sad to see her at all. It just filled me up with nice feelings inside. She was gone after a second, and I couldn't see her again in the darkness. The room slowly started lightening. I reached for my hearing aid headband and put it on. And now the world was really awake. I could hear the garbage trucks clunking down the street and the birds in our backyard. And down the hallway, I heard Mom's alarm beeping. Daisy's ghost made me feel super strong inside. Knowing wherever I am, she'd be there with me. I got up out of bed and went to my desk and wrote a little note to Mom. And I went into the living room where my packed bag was by the door. I opened it up and fished inside until I found what I was looking for. I took Babu back to my room, and I laid him in my bed and taped the little note to Mom on his chest. And then I covered him with my blanket so Mom would find him later. The note read, Dear Mom, I won't need Babu, but if you miss me, you can cuddle with him yourself. XO Augie. Day one. The bus ride went really fast. I sat by the window and Jack was next to me in the aisle seat. Summer and Maya were in front of us. Everyone was in a good mood. Kind of loud, laughing a lot. I noticed right away that Julian wasn't on our bus, even though Henry and Miles were. I figured he must be on the other bus, but then I overheard Miles tell Amos that Julian ditched the grade trip because he thought the whole nature retreat thing was quote, unquote, dorky. I got totally pumped because dealing with Julian for three days in a row and two nights was a major reason that I was nervous about this whole trip. So now without him there, I could really just relax and not worry about anything. We got to the nature reserve at around noon. The first thing we did was put our stuff down in the cabins. There were three bunk beds to every room. So me and Jack did rock, paper, scissors for the top bunk, and I won. Woohoo! And the other guys in the room were Reed and Tristan and Pablo and Nino. After we had lunch in the main cabin, we all went on a two-hour guided nature hike through the woods. But these were not woods like the kind they have in Central Park. These were real woods. Giant trees that almost totally blocked out the sunlight. Tangles of leaves and fallen tree trunks. Howls and chirps and really loud bird calls. There was a slight fog, too like a pale blue smoke all around us. So cool. The nature guide pointed everything out to us. The different types of trees we were passing, the insects inside the dead logs on the trail, the signs of deer and bears in the woods, what types of birds were whistling, and where to look for them. I realized that my Lobot hearing aids actually made me hear better than most people because I was usually the first person to hear a new bird call. It started to rain as we headed back to camp. I pulled on my rain poncho and pulled the hood up so my hearing aids wouldn't get wet. But my jeans and shoes got soaked by the time we reached our cabins. Everyone got soaked. It was fun, though. We had a wet sock fight in the cabin. Since it rained for the rest of the day, we spent most of the afternoon goofing off in the rec room. They had a ping pong table and old style arcade games like Pac-Man and Missile Command that we played until dinner time. Luckily, by then it had stopped raining, so we got to have a real campfire cookout. The log benches around the campfire were still a little damp, but we threw our jackets over them and hung out by the fire toasting s'mores, and eating the best roasted hot dogs I have ever, ever tasted. Mom was right about the mosquitoes. There were tons of them. But luckily, I had spritzed myself before I left the cabin, 
And I wasn't eaten alive like some of the other kids were. I loved hanging out by the campfire after dark. I loved the way bits of fire dust would float up and disappear into the night air. And how the fire lit up people's faces. I loved the sound the fire made, too. And how the woods were so dark that you couldn't see anything around you. And you'd look up and see a billion stars in the sky. The sky doesn't look like that in North River Heights. I've seen it look like that in Montauk, though. Like someone sprinkled salt on a shiny black table. I was so tired when I got back to the cabin that I didn't need to pull out the book to read. I fell asleep almost as fast as my head hit the pillow. And maybe I dreamed about the stars. I don't know. The fairgrounds. The next day was just as great as the first day. We went horseback riding in the morning, and in the afternoon, we repelled up some ginormous trees with the help of the nature guides. By the time we got back to the cabins for dinner, we were all really tired again. After dinner, they told us we had an hour to rest, and then we were going to take a 15-minute bus ride to the fairgrounds for an outdoor movie night. I hadn't had the chance to write a letter to Mom and Dad and Via yet. So I wrote one, telling them all about the stuff we did that day and the day before. I pictured myself reading it to them out loud when I got back, since there was just no way the letter would get home before I did. When we got to the fairgrounds, the sun was just starting to set. It was about 7.30. The shadows were really long on the grass, and the clouds were pink and orange. It looked like someone had taken sidewalk chalk and smudged the colors across the sky with their fingers. It's not that I haven't seen nice sunsets before in the city, because I have. Slivers of sunsets between buildings. But I wasn't used to seeing so much sky in every direction. Out here in the fairgrounds, I could understand why ancient people used to think the world was flat. And the sky was a dome that closed in on top of it. That's what it looked like from the fairgrounds, in the middle of this huge open field. Because we were the first school to arrive, we got to run around the field all we wanted, until the teachers told us it was time to lay out our sleeping bags on the ground and get good viewing seats. We unzipped our bags and laid them down like picnic blankets on the grass, in front of the giant movie screen in the middle of the field. Then we went to the row of food trucks parked at the edge of the field to load up on snacks and sodas and stuff like that. There were concession stands there too, like at a farmer's market, selling roasted peanuts and cotton candy. And up a little farther was a short row of carnival-type stalls, the kind where you can win a stuffed animal if you throw a baseball into a basket. Jack and I both tried and failed to win anything. But we heard Amos won a yellow hippo and gave it to Jimena. That was the big gossip that went around. The jock and the brainiac. From the food trucks, you could see the corn stalks in back of the movie screen. They covered about a third of the entire field. The rest of the field was completely surrounded by woods. As the sun sank lower in the sky... The tall trees at the entrance to the woods looked dark blue. By the time the other school buses pulled into the parking lots, we were back in our spots on the sleeping bags, right smack in front of the screen, the best seats in the whole field. Everyone was passing around snacks and having a great time. Me and Jack and Summer and Reed and Maya played Pictionary. We could hear the sounds of the other schools arriving the loud laughing and talking of kids coming out on the field on both sides of us. But we couldn't really see them. Though the sky was still light, the sun had gone down completely, and everything on the ground had turned deep purple. The clouds were shadows now. We had trouble even seeing the Pictionary cards in front of us. Just then, without any announcement, all the lights at the ends of the field went on at once. They were like big, bright stadium lights. 
I thought of that scene in Close Encounters when the alien ship lands and they're playing that music. Da da do da done. Everyone in the field started applauding and cheering like something great had just happened. Be kind to nature. An announcement came over the huge speakers next to the stadium lights. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 23rd annual big movie night at the Broarwood Nature Reserve. Welcome, teachers and students from MS342, the William Heath School. A big cheer went up on the left side of the field. Welcome, teachers and students from Glover Academy. Another cheer went up, this time from the right side of the field. And welcome teachers and students from the Beecher Prep School. Our whole group cheered as loudly as we could. We're thrilled to have you as our guests here tonight and thrilled that the weather is cooperating. In fact, can you believe what a beautiful night this is? Again, everyone whooped and hollered. So as we prepare the movie, we do ask that you take a few moments to listen to this important announcement. The Broarwood Nature Reserve, as you know, is dedicated to preserving our natural resources and the environment. We ask that you leave no litter behind. Clean up after yourselves. Be kind to nature, and it will be kind to you. We ask that you keep that in mind as you walk around the grounds. Do not venture beyond the orange cones at the edges of the fairgrounds. Do not go into the cornfields or the woods. Please keep the free roaming to a minimum. Even if you don't feel like watching the movie, your fellow students may feel otherwise. So please be courteous. No talking, no playing music, no running around. The restrooms are located on the other side of the concession stands. After the movie is over, it will be quite dark. So we ask that all of you stay with your schools as you make your way back to your buses. Teachers, there's usually at least one lost party on big movie nights at Broarwood. Don't let it happen to you. Tonight's movie presentation will be The Sound of Music. I immediately started clapping, even though I've seen it a few times before, because it was Via's favorite movie of all time. But I was surprised that a whole bunch of kids, not from Beecher, booed and hissed and laughed. Someone from the right side of the field even threw a soda can at the screen, which seemed to surprise Mr. Tushman. I saw him stand up and look in the direction of the can thrower, though I knew he couldn't see anything in the dark. The movie started playing right away. The stadium lights dimmed. Maria the nun was standing at the top of the mountain, twirling around and around. It had gotten chilly all of a sudden, so I put on my yellow Montauk hoodie and adjusted the volume on my hearing aids and leaned against my backpack and started watching. The hills are alive. The woods are alive. Somewhere around the boring part where the guy named Rolf and the oldest daughter are singing, You are 16, going on 17, Jack nudged me. Dude, I've got to pee, he said. We both got up and kind of hopscotched over the kids who were sitting or lying down on the sleeping bags. Summer waved as we passed, and I waved back. There were lots of kids from the other schools walking around by the food trucks, playing the carnival games, or just hanging out. Of course, there was a huge line for the toilets. Forget this. I'll just find a tree, said Jack. That's gross, Jack. Let's just wait, I answered. But he headed off to the row of trees at the edge of the field which was past the orange cones that we were specifically told not to go past. And of course, I followed him. And of course, we didn't have our flashlights because we forgot to bring them. 
It was so dark now, we literally couldn't see ten steps ahead of us as we walked toward the woods. Luckily, the movie gave off sunlight, so when we saw a flashlight coming toward us out of the woods, we knew immediately that it was Henry, Miles, and Amos. I guess they hadn't wanted to wait online to use the toilets either. Miles and Henry were still not talking to Jack, but Amos had let go of the war a while ago. And he nodded hello to us as they passed by. Be careful of the bears, shouted Henry. And he and Miles laughed as they walked away. Amos shook his head at us like, don't pay attention to them. Jack and I walked a little further until we were just inside the woods. Then Jack hunted around for the perfect tree and finally did his business, though it felt like he was taking forever. The woods were loud, with strange sounds and chirps and croaks, like a wall of noise coming out of the trees. Then we started hearing loud snaps, not far from us, almost like cap gun pops that definitely weren't insect noises. And far away, like in another world, we could hear raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Oh, that's much better, said Jack, zipping up. Now I have to pee, I said, which I did on the nearest tree. No way I was going farther in like Jack did. Do you smell that? Like firecrackers, he said, coming over to me. Oh, yeah, that's what that is, I answered, zipping up. Weird. Let's go. Alien. We headed back the way we came, in the direction of the giant screen. That's when we walked straight into a group of kids we didn't know. They'd just come out of the woods doing stuff I'm sure they didn't want their teachers to know about. I could smell the smoke now, the smell of both firecrackers and cigarettes. They pointed a flashlight at us. There were six of them, four boys and two girls. They looked like they were in the seventh grade. What school are you from? One of the boys called out. Beat your prep, Jack started to answer, when all of a sudden... One of the girls started screaming. Oh, my God, she shrieked, holding her hand over her eyes like she was crying. I figured maybe a huge bug had just flown into her face or something. No way, one of the boys cried out. And he started flicking his hand in the air like he just touched something hot. And then he covered his mouth. No freaking way, man. No freaking way. All of them started half laughing and half covering their eyes now, pushing each other and cursing loudly. What is that? said the kid who was pointing the flashlight at us. And it was only then that I realized that the flashlight was pointed right at my face. And what they were talking about, screaming about, was me. Let's get out of here, Jack said to me quietly. And he pulled me by my sweatshirt sleeve and started walking away from them. Wait, 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 yelled the guy with the flashlight, cutting us off. He pointed the flashlight right in my face again. And now he was only about five feet away. Oh, man. Oh, man, he said, shaking his head, his mouth wide open. What happened to your face? Stop it, Eddie, said one of the girls. I didn't know we were watching Lord of the Rings tonight, he said. Look, guys, it's Gollum. This made his friends hysterical. Again, we tried to walk away from them, and again the kid named Eddie cut us off. He was at least a head taller than Jack, who was about a head taller than me. So the guy looked huge to me. No, man, it's Alien, said one of the other kids. No, 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 man, it's an orc, laughed Eddie, pointing the flashlight in my face again. This time he was right in front of us. Leave him alone, okay, said Jack, pushing the hand holding the flashlight away. Make me, answered Eddie, pointing the flashlight in Jack's face now. What's your problem, dude, said Jack. Your boyfriend's my problem. Jack! 
Let's just go, I said, pulling him by the arm. Oh, man, it talks, screamed Eddie, shining the flashlight in my face again. And one of the other guys threw a firecracker at our feet. Jack tried to push past Eddie, but Eddie shoved his hands into Jack's shoulders and pushed him hard, which made Jack fall backward. Eddie, screamed one of the girls. Look, I said, stepping in front of Jack and holding my hands up in the air like a traffic cop. We're a lot smaller than you guys. Are you talking to me, Freddy Krueger? I don't think you want to mess with me, you ugly freak, said Eddie. And this was the point where I knew I should run away as fast as I could. But Jack was still on the ground, and I wasn't about to leave him. Yo, dude, said a new voice behind us. What's up, man? Eddie spun around and pointed his flashlight toward the voice. For a second, I couldn't believe who it was. Leave them alone, dude, said Amos, with Miles and Henry right behind him. Says who, said one of the guys with Eddie. Just leave them alone, dude, Amos repeated calmly. Are you a freak, too, said Eddie. They're all a bunch of freaks, said one of his friends. Amos didn't answer them, but looked at us. Come on, guys, let's go. Mr. Tushman's waiting for us. I knew that was a lie, but I helped Jack get up, and we started walking over to Amos. Then, out of the blue, the Eddie guy grabbed my hood as I passed by him, yanking it really hard, so I was pulled backward and fell flat on my back. It was a hard fall. And I hurt my elbow pretty bad on a rock. I couldn't really see what happened afterward. Except that Amos rammed into the Eddie guy like a monster truck. And they both fell down to the ground next to me. Everything got really crazy after that. Someone pulled me up by my sleeve and yelled, Run! And someone else screamed, Get him! At the same time. And for a few seconds... I actually had two people pulling the sleeves of my sweatshirt in opposite directions. I heard them both cursing until my sweatshirt ripped and the first guy yanked me by my arm and started pulling me behind him as we ran, which I did as fast as I could. I could hear footsteps just behind us, chasing us, and voices shouting and girls screaming. But it was so dark, I didn't know whose voices they were. Only that everything felt like we were underwater. We were running like crazy, and it was pitch black. And whenever I started to slow down, the guy pulling me by my arm would yell, Don't stop!